Good morning, everybody, and welcome. We are very happy to offer a fond welcome once again to Swami Maidananda, who will be speaking today on Swami Vivekananda's philosophy of integral Advaita. The Swami is a monk of the Ramakrishna order posted to the Vedanta Society of Southern California, Hollywood. He studied at the University of California, Berkeley, where he earned his BA in English, <coughs> graduating summa cum laude with highest honors in English, minoring in philosophy. He received his PhD in English in 2009. From 2006 to 2007, he attended the Humboldt University of Berlin as a Fulbright Fellow and was a visiting student at Magdalen College at University of Oxford. That was from 2000 to 2001. He holds and has held numerous faculty appointments in India and the United States. Religious Director for the Hindu Students' Organization, University of South Southern California, Senior Research Fellow in Philosophy, the Ramakrishna Institute of Moral and Spiritual Education in Mysore, India, Head of the Program in Philosophy at the Ramakrishna Mission Vivekananda Educational and Research Institute in Berlamat, West Bengal. He is also the editor of the Bloomsbury Research Handbook of Vedanta and section editor for Hindu and cross-cultural philosophy of religion, the International Journal of Hindu Studies. There's more. <laughs> Quite a bit, but I haven't included everything, Swamiji. As well as being the author of innumerable papers and articles in the last few years, Swami Medananda has authored three major books, The Dialectics of Aesthetic Agency, Reevaluating German Aesthetics from Kant to Adorno, Infinite Paths to Infinite Reality, Sri Ramakrishna and Cross-Cultural Philosophy of Religion, and most recently, his highly acclaimed work, Swami Vivekananda's Vedantic Cosmopolitanism, where he demonstrates the sophistication and enduring value of Vivekananda's views on the limits of reason, the dynamics of religious faith, and the hard problem of consciousness. Thank you. Oh, and before I forget, this is his most recent book. Swamiji, welcome and please do come. Om Namah Shri Atirajaya Vivekananda Suraye Satchit Sukhaswarupaya Swamini Tapaharini It's a pleasure to be here again. Last time, it was about four years ago, I was in white. Now I'm in ochre with a new name, but the same person. And I see a lot of familiar faces, so thank you all for coming. Thank you, Diane, for the very generous introduction. And uh, my humble pranams to revered Swami Sarvapriyananda Ji. He's been my mentor since even before joining the order. He met me for the first time in 2009. And since then, I've, I've considered him one of my most important mentors and friends. So it's a real honor to be here today. As Diane mentioned, I'll be speaking today on my new book. Uh, basically, I'm summarizing chapters two and three of my new book, Swami Vivekananda's Vedantic Cosmopolitanism. If you want more details, please do look at the book. What happened last time is a lot of people sort of freaked out or talked about my ideas based entirely on the lecture I gave here four years ago without bothering to read the book. Please don't do that. That's lazy. So read the book first, and then you can do whatever you want, say whatever you want. Or at least just read chapters two and three of the book. It's a 10-chapter book, but I only ask that you read chapters two and three. All right, so I'll be speaking today on Swami Vivekananda's philosophy of integral Advaita. We all know that Swami Vivekananda was a great champion of Advaita Vedanta. It's absolutely uncontroversial. Nobody can deny it. But there has been tremendous scholarly controversy about the precise nature of Swamiji's Advaita philosophy. When I say Swamiji, I mean Vivekananda. Sometimes in the West, people get confused about that. So here, here are the two most controversial questions. 
First question, to what extent, if at all, does Swamiji's Advaita philosophy differ from Shankara's Advaita Vedanta? This is the first million dollar question. Second million dollar question, to what extent, if at all, does Swamiji's Advaita philosophy differ from his Guru's philosophy, his Guru Sri Ramakrishna's philosophy? These are two distinct but interrelated questions. Okay? Now, there are three main camps, depending on how they respond to these two questions. I'm going to explain these camps and then explain where I stand and then we'll move forward from there. First camp, what I call the Shankarite interpretation. So the scholars in this first camp answer the first question by saying, Swamiji's philosophy essentially agrees in all fundamentals with Shankara's Advaita Vedanta. But because Shankara wrote his bhashyas around the 8th century and Swamiji wrote in the 19th century, there are differences in emphasis. It's a, Swamiji is a kind of modern day Shankara. He's kind of modernized Shankara's teachings for present circumstances. This is the first camp. However, with regard to the second question, there are two sub-camps within this first camp, depending on how they answer the second question, regarding the relationship between Swami Vivekananda and Sri Ramakrishna. First sub-camp within this first camp, the Shankarite camp, the first sub-camp says both Swami Vivekananda and Sri Ramakrishna were both followers, basically, of Shankara's Advaita Vedanta. So Sri Ramakrishna taught basically a Shankarite philosophy updated from modern times, and so did Swami Vivekananda. This is the first camp. Who held this view? People like Swami Dhireshananda, TMP Mahadevan, and Dinesh Chandra Bhattacharya. There are many others. You can see, find further references in my book. Second subcamp within this first Shankarite camp argue that even though Swami Vivekananda taught a philosophy which is basically in line with Shankara's, he thereby deviated from his Guru Sri Ramakrishna's teachings, which were not Shankarite in orientation and come much closer to Tantra or Kashmiri Shaivism. Scholars like Walter Neville, Nalini Devdas, and Frida Matchett make this, make this argument. That's the first subcamp. First subcamp, Shankarite interpretation of Swamiji's philosophy. Uh, subcamp within the first camp says that both Swami Vivekananda and Sri Ramakrishna taught basically a Shankarite philosophy. And the second subcamp says that Swamiji taught uh, a Shankarite philosophy, but thereby deviating from his guru who taught a more world affirming kind of Advaita philosophy, more akin to Tantra. Second camp, some scholars say that Swami Vivekananda's philosophy if you're really honest and critical when you read his work, you'll, you'll find that it's full of contradictions. On one page, he's saying things that echo Shankara's ideas. On the next page, he seems to be saying things which echo Sri Ramakrishna's ideas. And it's a kind of hodgepodge, and uh, it's, it's full of contradictions. Who are some of these scholars? Omiyo Pishen is one of them. Uh, another one is Thomas J. Green, who wrote an entire book on Max Mueller and Swami Vivekananda, published in 2016, he makes a similar argument. He says, for instance, that Swami Vivekananda, when he talks about practical Vedanta, the need to, to worship God in human beings by serving them, that is in deep conflict with other places in his work where he seems to commit to Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya, the idea that this world is ultimately unreal. So this is the kind of argument that these scholars make in the second camp, that you can't give clear and consistent answers to questions one and two because Swamiji himself was not consistent and clear. Third camp. This is a camp represented by a number of scholars. I'll mention a few of them. Satish Chandra Chatterjee, R.K. Dasgupta, Jeffrey Long, Andrew Nicholson, Swami Tapasyanandaji, Swami Shraddhananda, and one living Swami, Swami Bhajanandaji. And I'm going to defend this third camp's approach to Swamiji's philosophy as well. So I place myself in this third camp. This third camp answers question one as follows. They say that Swami Vivekananda's Advaitic philosophy's philosophy differs fundamentally from Shankara's philosophy in a number of respects. In the course of this lecture, I'm going to explain six key ways in which Swami Vivekananda's Advaita philosophy is broader than Shankara's Advaita philosophy and in some ways different from his philosophy as well. And regarding the, the second question, relationship between Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda, scholars in this third, third camp argue that it was Sri Ramakrishna who taught Swamiji this broad, non-sectarian Advaitic philosophy. In my previous book, some of you may have read it or are at least familiar with it, the previous book was called Infinite Paths to Infinite Reality, and that's where I discuss Sri Ramakrishna's philosophy. 
I call his philosophy Vigyana Vedanta because I think that he bases his core philosophical teachings on the basis of his spiritual state of Vigyana. And my contention is that the Advaita Vedanta philosophy taught by Swami Vivekananda throughout the world in the West in India was none other than Sri Ramakrishna's philosophy of Vigyana Vedanta. Then you might wonder, well, why don't I call Swami Vivekananda's philosophy Vigyana Vedanta? I call it Integral Advaita. Why? The reason is because, for whatever reason, Swami Vivekananda himself very rarely used the term Vigyana. And when he did, it was not uh, consistently in the sense that Sri Ramakrishna meant it. There is one place where I think it's very interesting, where he does use the term Vigyana almost exactly in the way that uh, Sri Ramakrishna did. We can talk about that later. It's in my book. But because he didn't use the term Vigyana, I wanted to use a term that captured how Swami Vivekananda himself explained this Advaitic uh, philosophy. So I use the word integral. What do I mean by integral? What I mean is, integral is, is etymologically, it means whole, the whole. So it's an Advaita that encompasses everything. It's an all-encompassing oneness. Sri Ramakrishna, he used to teach this. He, in one place, it, when explaining Vigyana Vedanta, he used to say, Ishwar Jeev Jagat Shab Jodhya Ekti. Personal God, individual souls, and this entire universe. It's, it all constitutes one divine reality. So it's, a, it's an Advaita that encompasses everything rather than excluding anything. So it's in that sense that I'm characterizing Swami Vivekananda's philosophy as integral Advaita. You might wonder at this point, well, Sri Ramakrishna himself, when explaining Vigyana Vedanta, often said that it's akin to Ramanuja's Vishtadvaita philosophy. And in fact, some people, including the author of Kothamrita, Mohanlal Gupta, believed because of that, that Sri Ramakrishna's philosophy was basically Ramanuja's Vishtadvaita. But there's a crucial difference, something I think Mohanlal Gupta missed, which is that Ramanuja does not accept the reality of Nirguna Brahman, non-dual pure consciousness. He accepts it in a different sense. He says that Nirguna Brahman, yes, in the scriptures they talk about Nirguna Brahman. What it means is Brahman, Vishnu Narayana, the personal God, is devoid of all inauspicious qualities. But this is not the sense in which Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda accept Nirguna Brahman. They really fully accept the reality of non-dual pure consciousness. Ramanuja does not. So that's a side note. Now, as I mentioned in the course of this lecture, I want to discuss six key philosophical doctrines of Swami Vivekananda's Integral Advaita. And I'll try to do two things, show how each of these doctrines differs from in being generally broader than Shankara's Advaita Vedanta, and how Swami Vivekananda learned each of these six doctrines from his guru, Sri Ramakrishna. So I'll be referring to Sri Ramakrishna's teachings as well. First doctrine, and what I'm gonna do is just run through the six doctrines first briefly as a kind of outline, and then I'll go through each one in some detail. Doctrine number one, the impersonal Brahman and the personal Shakti, the personal God, are equally real aspects of one in the same infinite divine reality. Doctrine number two, this world is a real manifestation of Shakti. Number three, each one of us, each soul is potentially divine, but Swami Vivekananda very deliberately uses broad and capacious language to encompass different possible relationships between the individual soul and God, including the Advaitic identity, Jiva is just one with Brahman, the Vishtadvaitic idea that the soul is part of God, and the Dvaitic idea, the Dvaita idea, that the soul is a kind of servant of, of God who's the master. And he says all of these relationships are equally valid. Fourth doctrine is what Swami Vivekananda called practical Vedanta. I just mentioned it, but I'll just mention it again. Swami Vivekananda insisted again and again that the highest worship is the worship of God in human beings by serving them in a spirit of worship. Doctrine number five, all four yogas, bhakti yoga, jnana yoga, karma yoga, raja yoga, are direct and independent means or paths to salvation. And sixth doctrine, Swami Vivekananda often taught the harmony of religions, starting, of course, in 1893 in the Parliament of Religions. One thing that I think scholars have overlooked is that how he explained the harmony of religions actually evolved in the course of his thinking in the 1890s. And I want to emphasize two key phases in his thinking. 
Between September 1894 and May 1895, for a period of about nine months, he taught the harmony of religions on the basis of what he called the three stages of Vedanta, Dvaita, Vishta Dvaita, and Advaita. And that phase of his thinking privileged Advaita over theistic paths. He aligned theistic paths with Dvaita or Vishta Dvaita, but he says ultimately the highest stage is Advaita Vedanta. Starting in late 1895, all the way until the end of his life, if you look carefully at his lectures on the harmony of religions, you'll find that he never discusses the three stages of Vedanta in the context of the harmony of religions. Instead, he regrounds the harmony of religions on the basis of the four yogas. And I'm going to explain at the end of my lecture how he does that. But the key difference is that he puts theistic paths and Advaita Vedanta and Buddhism on an equal footing, which he didn't do for that brief nine-month period between 1894 and May 1895. So, now that I've summarized the six key doctrines, let's go into some more detail, starting with doctrine number one. Swami Vivekananda's understanding of God. He understood God as both personal and impersonal. That's very important. Where did he learn it? He learned it from his guru, Sri Ramakrishna. If you study the Kathamrita, ideally in the original Bangla, you'll find him saying things like this, Brahma o Shukti Abhed. Brahman, Nirguna Brahman, non-dual pure consciousness, and Shakti, the personal God, are abhid, which means inseparable but equally real aspects of one and the same infinite divine reality. He says again, Vigyani dekhe jini nirgun tini shogun. The Vigyani, the person who has attained the state of Vigyana, realizes that the same infinite divine reality is both Nirguna, non-dual impersonal pure consciousness, and Saguna, the personal God. In a slightly more, uh, in, in, in somewhat more detail, he says, Jokontini nishkriyo tokonami brumma bolekoi. Jokontini sishti sisi bolekoi chin tokonami shukti bolekoi. When I refer to God as inactive, when I think of God as inactive, I call it Brahman. Or when I think of it as static. When I think of that same God as creating, preserving, and destroying the universe, I call God Shakti or Kali. Okay, so just so Brahman and Shakti are, are the static and dynamic aspects of one and the same divine reality. This is what Sri Ramakrishna taught. And he would often use analogies like Brahman and Shakti are inseparable, like fire and its power to burn. Ugni Artandahika Shakti. And this, it's the same water, whether it's still or whether it's agitated or in waves. Right? And we'll find Swami Vivekananda using very similar language. So Swami Vivekananda says, for instance, in one place, our religion, meaning the Hindu religion, t preaches an impersonal, personal God. In another place, he says the following. This is his lecture, The Women of India. The central conception of Hindu philosophy is of the absolute. That is the background of the universe. This absolute being, of whom we can predicate nothing, so here I take him to mean the impersonal absolute Brahman, has its power spoken of as she, with the capital S. That is, the real personal God in India is she. This Shakti of the Brahman is always in the feminine gender. So notice the emphasis on the real personal God. Shakti is the real personal God, which is inseparable from Brahman. Sh Shakti is just the dynamic aspect of Brahman. But you might say, well, there are a lot of places where he seems to privilege the impersonal God. How do we explain that and reconcile it with the kind of interpretation I'm offering? What I think he does in many places is he takes the terminology and doctrines of classical Advaita Vedanta taught by Shankara and Shankara's followers. And he subtly reconceptualizes them. He gives them a, a different meaning, more in line with Sri Ramakrishna's Vigyana Vedanta. So to give you one example of this in this particular context is the doctrine of impersonality, which is very, very strong. It's pronounced in classical Advaita Vedanta. Shankara talks about Nirvishesha Brahman very frequently. His followers talk about Nirguna Brahman and Nirvishesha Brahman constantly. Okay. How does Swami Vivekananda understand impersonality? Let's look at one passage. This comes from his second practical Vedanta lecture delivered in 1896. He says the following. The impersonal God is a living God, a principle. The difference between personal and impersonal is this, that the personal is only a man. And the impersonal idea is that he, capital H, is the angel, the man, the animal, and yet something more which we cannot see. Because impersonality includes all personalities, is the sum total of everything in the universe, and infinitely more besides. This, I think, agrees very well with Sri Ramakrishna's idea that 
this Vigyana Vedanta idea, which is, it's an Advaita, but it's an all-encompassing all oneness that includes the personal God, the entire universe, all the individual souls. So that's why I'm calling Swami Vivekananda's philosophy integral Advaita. This is an impersonality that includes all personalities. By contrast, Shankara and his followers hold that Nirguna Brahman, the impersonal absolute, excludes all personality. You might argue with me on this. You might ask, where does he say it? So I'm going to tell you, in both English and in Sanskrit. In his commentary on Brahma Sutra 2.1.14, he explains the ontological status of Ishvara, the personal God, as follows. First, Gambinanaji's translation. Thus, Ishvara's rulership, omniscience, and omnipotence are dependent on the limiting adjuncts, the upadis, conjured up by ignorance. But from the ultimate standpoint, such terms as the ruler, the ruled, omniscience, etc., cannot be used with regard to the Atman in its true nature after the removal of all limiting adjuncts through knowledge. Tad evam avidyatma kopadi paricheda peksham eva ishvarasya ishvaratvam sarvagnyatvam sarvashaktitvam cha na paramatataha vidya apasta sarvopadi swarupe atmani ishitra ishitavya sarvagnyatvadi vyavahara upapadyate. So according to Shankara, all of the personal God's qualities, omniscience, omnipotence, being gracious and, and loving, they, they're only true, they only exist from the empirical standpoint, from the vyavaharika standpoint. They are all ultimately non-existent upadis superimposed on, onto non-dual Brahman, the impersonal absolute, through avidya, through our own ignorance of Brahman. But from the ultimate standpoint, Shankara clearly says, only Nirguna Brahman itself exists, completely devoid of all upadis, including the upadis, which constitute the attributes, attributes of the personal God. There's a lot more I can say, but uh, please look at the chapter for more details. Doctrine two. What was Swami Vivekananda's understanding of the world and its ontological status? Let's begin again, as we always should, with Sri Ramakrishna's teachings on the world. Mohandranath Gupta, <clears throat> on 16th December 1883, asks Sri Krishna, is the world unreal? Bangla here is Jogot ki mitha. Sri Krishna answers as follows, why should the world be unreal? That is the way that Advaita Jnanis reason. Now here again, so for those of you who don't know Bangla, it's unfortunate because there are some very significant differences sometimes between Nikhilanandaji's English translation and the original Bangla. Here's a case where he translates the original Bangla, Osha Bicharit Kotha, as what you are asking is a matter for philosophical discussion, which I think is way off, to be honest. And so that's why instead I translate it as so Osha Bicharit Kotha as that is the way that Advaita Jnanis reason. That's the, we can quibble, but I think that that's, that comes closer to what Swami, uh, Sri Ramakrishna meant. Why? Because look at what the sentences that follow this statement. Osha Bicharikata. Then, Sri Ramakrishna says, in the beginning, when a man reasons following the Advaita Vedantic method of neti neti, not this, not this, he realizes that Brahman is not the living beings, not the universe, not the 24 cosmic principles. All these things become like a dream to him. Then comes the affirmation of what has been denied and he feels that God himself has become the universe and all living beings. So I think the context here clearly suggests that it's a special kind of vichara that Sri Ramakrishna is talking about. It's the vichara, the reasoning of the Advaita Jnana Yogi, who says Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. So I'll just read the whole Bangla here. Mithya keno, osha bichare kotha, prathom ta neti neti bichar korba shomai. So he's clearly saying neti neti vichara. Neti neti bichar korba shomai tini jib non, jagat non, chotur bingshi tattu non, হয়ে যায় এসব স্বপ্ন বধ হয়ে যায় তারপর অনুলম বিলম তখন তিনি জীব জগৎ হয়েছেন বোধ হয় সো ইস ক্লিয়ারলি ডিস্টিংগুইশিং হিয়ার এন্ড মেনি আদার প্লেসেস টু ডিফারেন্ট স্টেজেস ইন স্পিরিচুয়াল রিয়েলাইজেশন দেয়ার ইস দ্য জ্ঞান স্টেজ অফ স্পিরিচুয়াল রিয়েলাইজেশন ওয়ের দ্য জ্ঞানি ফিলস ব্রহ্ম সত্যম জগৎ মিথ্যা দিস ওয়ার্ল্ড ইজ লাইক এ ড্রিম ইটস আনরিয়েল এন্ড দেস আ ফার্দার স্টেজ এন্ড দিস ইজ হোয়াটস রিয়েলি ইউনিক অবাউট শ্রী রামকৃষ্ণস ফিলসফি ইন ইস টিচিংস দেস আ ফার্দার স্টেজ কল বিজ্ঞানা ওয়ের ইউ রিয়েলাইজ দ্য এভরিথিং ইজ আ রিয়েল ম্যানিফেস্টেশন অফ শক্তি ব্রহ্ম সত্যম জগৎ সত্যম দ্য লাস্ট ওয়ার্ডস অফ স্বামী তুরিয়ানজি অন ইস ডেথ বেড সো নাও স্বামী বিবেকানন্দ আই বিলিভ ইউ ফলোজ হিজ গুরু শ্রী রামকৃষ্ণ ইন দিস রিগার্ড ইস ওয়েল হি সেজ ইট ইন মেনি মেনি প্লেসেস আই জাস্ট ওয়ান্ট কোট 
one passage where this is from his God in Everything lecture. Just notice even the title of the lecture is very, very Vigyana oriented, God in Everything. He says that the world is not unreal, but actually divine. And you'll find that he explains this on the basis of Sri Ramakrishna's Vigyana Vedanta. This is the quotation. Swami Vivekananda says, here I can only lay before you what the Vedanta seeks to teach, and that is the deification of the world. The Vedanta does not in reality denounce the world. The ideal of renunciation nowhere attains such a height as in the teachings of the Vedanta, but at the same time dry suicidal advice is not intended. It really means deification of the world, giving up the world as we think of it, as we know it, as it appears to us, and to know what it really is. Deify it. It is God alone. And these passages can be multiplied, where again and again he's saying that Vedanta does not teach that the world is unreal, but that the, everything in the world is a manifestation of God. Now, there's another important issue here. He gave a series of famous lectures on Maya. And he gives the word Maya a very new interpretation. Again, this is another example of where Swami Vivekananda takes a classical Advaitic doctrine and gives it a subtly different interpretation that brings the doctrine closer to Sri Ramakrishna than to Shankara. So Maya, how does he interpret Maya? Let's look at his lecture, Maya and Illusion, delivered in 1896, where he says that the word Maya is generally, quote, used, though incorrectly, to denote illusion or delusion or some such thing, end quote. So he says, it's wrong, it's mistaken to think that maya means illusion. The world is not an illusion. The world is maya, but maya in a different sense. What sense? It seems to me, I, I, uh, it, I, I look pretty comprehensively at all the different places where he talks about maya. He doesn't have one, but two different explanations of maya. One which I characterize as, as a phenomenological interpretation of maya, and one as an ontological interpretation of maya. So let's start with what I'm, what I'm calling the phenomenological interpretation of Maya, he says the following, thus we find that Maya is not a theory for the explanation of the world. It is simply a statement of facts as they exist, that the very basis of our being is contradiction, that everywhere we have to move through this tremendous contradiction, that wherever there is good, there must also be evil, and wherever there is evil, there must be some good. Wherever there is life, death must follow as its shadow, and everyone who smiles will have to weep, and vice versa nor can the state of things be remedied. So here, I call this phenomenological because he's just, he's, he's saying Maya is not an ontological theory about whether the world is real or unreal. It's just a matter of the facts of life. What happens when we pursue this, whatever, some, something that we think is gonna make us really happy? It makes us happy for a second, then we become miserable again. So he's talking about life as being full of contradictions. This is Maya, in the phenomenological sense. But there's another sense. In other places, he does give an ontological explanation of Maya, but which I think differs from Shankara's explanation of Maya. What he says is, in these places where he gives an ontological explanation of Maya, is that Maya is basically names and forms, and that they don't have independent existence apart from Brahman. Not that they're unreal, but that they don't have independent existence apart from Brahman. He says this, for instance, I'll read this passage. He says, it is the form that makes the wave different from the sea. And notice the sea wave metaphor, which Sri Ramakrishna used to use. Suppose the wave subsides. Will the form remain? No, it will vanish. The existence of the wave was entirely dependent upon the existence of the sea, but the existence of the sea was not at all dependent upon the existence of the wave. The form remains so long as the wave remains, but as soon as the wave leaves it, it vanishes, it cannot remain. This name and form is the outcome of what is called maya. It is this maya that is making individuals, making one appear different from another. According to the Advaita philosophy then, this maya or ignorance or name and form, or as it has been called in Europe, time, space and causality, he's thinking of Schopenhauer and Kant, is out of this one infinite existence showing us the manifoldness of the universe. In substance, this universe is one. So maya, for Swami Vivekananda, understood as name and form, he says, in some sense it doesn't exist, but not in the sense that it's unreal, that it's non-existent. It's that it has, the, names and forms have no existence apart from Brahman, just as the wave has no existence apart from the ocean. But the wave is perfectly real. You don't say waves are unreal. You don't say that they don't exist. You say that they don't exist apart from the ocean. So exactly in the same way, this world of names and forms is perfectly real, but entirely dependent for, exi for its existence on Brahman. He says this even more emphatically in um, 
a lecture called Hints on Practical Spirituality, delivered in 1899. He says, the reality of everything is the same infinite. This is not idealism. It is not that the world does not exist. It has a relative existence and fulfills all its requirements, but it has no independent existence. This is his own language. It exists because of the absolute reality beyond time, space, and causation. So for Swamiji, the world of names and forms does exist, but depends for its existence on Brahman. Now you might ask, well, doesn't Shankara teach the same thing? My answer is no, but of course, you know, intelligent people can disagree about these things. But every Vedantic school accepts that the world has no independent existence apart from Brahman. Ramanuja accepts it, Madhva accepts it, so that's not what distinguishes Shankara's school of Advaita Vedanta from the other Vedantic schools. Shankara goes much further. He says, yes, the world has no independent existence apart from, from Brahman, but he draws a further conclusion, and he says that, Therefore, and for other logical reasons, the world does not even exist from the ultimate standpoint. And this is where Shankara's philosophy deviates from other schools of Vedanta, like Ramanuja's philosophy and Madhva's philosophy, and Achinta Bheda Veda of Chaitanya, and Shuddha Dvaita of Vallabha. Every single school of, of Vedanta accepts that the world is, ha, it depends for its existence on Brahman. Keep that in mind. Shankara, there has to be something distinctive about Shankara's school, and that is that from the ultimate standpoint, the world does not even exist. Where does he say this? In many, many places. I don't have time to catalog all of them, but I'll just mention a few. Shankara says, for instance, in his commentary on Brahma Sutra Bhashya 2.1.27, this entire world of names and forms is conjured up by ignorance, avidya kalpita, and that Brahman, in its ultimate nature, remains unchanged and beyond all empirical dealings. Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. Also think about his favorite analogy, the rope snake analogy. He likens the world of names and forms to the snake. And it's through ignorance of the rope that we mistakenly superimpose the snake onto the rope. Did the rope ever exist? No. I mean, the rope existed. The snake, did the sn snake actually ever exist? No. It never existed. It only existed in our minds because we're misperceiving the rope as a snake, right? Does it make sense to say that the snake is a real manifestation of, this, of the rope? No. I think it makes more sense to say that the snake is an illusory manifestation, uh, an illusory appearance of the rope. And that captures the difference between Shankara's Advaita Vedanta and the Vigyana Vedanta of Sri Ramakrishna and the integral Advaita of Swami Vivekananda. Sri Ramakrishna, instead of using this rope snake metaphor, he never used it, even once in the gospel. In one place, he's describing his Vigyana experience and he uses the analogy of wax. He says it was as if Everything was made of wax. Shab momed. Shab jana momed. The trees seemed to be made of wax. The floor seemed to be made of wax. The horse carriages seemed to be made of wax. What does he mean by that? He means, as far as I understand it, that everything in the world is a real manifestation, a real formation of God, of Brahman. Brahman itself has become the 24 cosmic principles. And this understanding, this analogy, dovetails much better than Shankara's rope snake analogy with the Chandogya Upanishad metaphors. Clay in pots, golden ornaments. In the Upanishad, Chandogya Upanishad, the question is raised, what is the relationship between Brahman and Jagat? And it uses these beautiful metaphors. Just as different ornaments can be made out of gold, or just as different kinds of pots, differently sized pots, differently shaped pots, can be made out of the same clay, just so this entire world of names and forms is nothing but different manifestations of one and the same Brahman. OK, that's doctrine two. Doctrine three. This is regarding one of Swami, Swamiji's most famous doctrines. His doctrine that each soul is potentially divine. First, again, I'm, my argument is that he takes this doctrine from, not from Shankara, but from Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna says, in the presence of Naran, this was on 29th September 1884, he looks around and he says, no one else is here and you are my own people. Let me tell you something. You know that he's going to say something very important, very, very deep when he says this. I have come to the final realization that God is the whole and I am a part of him. That God is the master and I am his servant. Furthermore, I think every now and then that he is I and I am he. Shesh e bujachi. Tini purno amita rongsho. Tini prabhu amita dash. Abar ek ek par bhavi tini ami ami tini. Sri Ramakrishna was fond of reciting a famous shloka about Hanuman, how Hanuman looked upon Rama. 
most of you know it, but it's exactly the same idea. But the key here is that Sri Ramakrishna is not saying that the Advaitic identity is higher than the other one, so that ultimate, from the ultimate standpoint, that's the truth, and that everything else is lower, no lower and higher. Each of these relationships between the soul and God is equally true and equally valuable. And it's really a matter of temperament. Do you want to become sugar or eat sugar? What does Swami Vivekananda say? He says the same thing, I think. He says each soul is potentially divine. And I think he's very deliberately vague here on purpose in order to encompass all three of the main relationships between the soul and God, the Advaitic, the Vishta Advaitic, and the Dvaitic. He makes this explicit in a number of places, but I'm going to quote from one passage. This is from his lecture, The Common Bases of Hinduism, delivered in 1897. He says, there may be differences as to the relation between the soul and God. According to one sect, the soul may be eternally different from God. According to another, it may be a spark of that infinite fire. Yet again, according to others, it may be one with that infinite. It does not matter what our interpretation is, so long as we hold on to the one basic belief that the soul is infinite, that the soul was never created and therefore will never die, that it had to pass and evolve into various bodies till it attained perfection in the human one. In that, we are all agreed. We all hold in India that the soul is by its nature pure and perfect, infinite in power, and blessed. And he says something, so notice here that he's not saying that the Advaitic identity of the soul and God is somehow higher or more true than the other the, the Vishta Dvaitic and the Dvaitic understandings of the relationship between soul and God. He says that they're, they're all true. He says the same thing. This is very, very obscure now. This is um, in, a, in the Bengali work written by Swami Abhijajanandaji, Shamajit Podoprante. It's a recording of a conversation between Sh Shuddhanandaji, a disciple of Swami Vivekananda, and Vivekananda himself. Shuddhanandaji had a book with him. And Swamiji asked him, what are you reading? And he said, I'm reading Shankara's commentary on the Brahma Sutra. And then this is what Swamiji says. Who has told you that the sutras, the Brahma Sutras, support the Advaita philosophy alone? Shankaracharya was an Advaitin, so he tried to interpret the sutras in terms of Advaita philosophy. But you should try to understand the literal meaning, Okkorato, of the sutras themselves. The true intention of Vyasa, the author of the Brahma Sutra, the, the true Obiprai of Vyasa. And then Swamiji himself gives an example from the Brahma Sutra. He says, take for example the sutra, Asmin Nasya Cha Tad Yogam Shasti. It's from 1.1.19 of Brahma Sutra. Swamiji says, I think that if we interpret this sutra correctly, we will find that Bhagavan Veda Vyasa, whom he took to be the author of the Brahma Sutra, indicated both Advaita and Vishta Advaita through it. Ete Advaita or Vishta Advaita Ubhoi Vadi Bhagavan Veda Vyasa Kotrik Shuchito Hoyche. So you see, he, he consistently and systematically interprets the relationship between God and the soul. Let me explain briefly. 1.1.19 of Brahma Sutra is Asmin Nasya Cha Tad Yogam Shasi. So the sutra just says, the scriptures, the Upanishads, teach the yogam, the union of the soul, the jiva, and Brahman. This is what the sutra itself says. And what Swamiji says is, the term yoga here is deliberately vague, even in the sutra itself. Yoga can encompass identity, but it can also encompass a part-whole relationship. It can also encompass a master-servant relationship, servant-master relationship. So, so he's doing something very subtle here. He's interpreting, he's saying that there's a very important reason why the sutrakara used the term yoga, which is so capacious. It's not, it's not straightforward identity, tadatmya or something like that. Now, fourth doctrine. This is his famous doctrine of practical Vedanta. He gave a series of lectures on this topic in London. He learned this also from Sri Ramakrishna. We all, most of us know this. One day, in the presence of Naren, Sri Ramakrishna is talking about Vaishnava sadhanas. And one of the sadhanas is daya, it's compassion toward all living beings. And Sri Ramakrishna goes into a state of spiritual bhava. And he says, compassion, who are we to have compassion for others? We're worms crawling on this earth. Shiv jnane jive seva. Shiva jnane jive seva. It means we should be worshiping God by serving God in all human beings, by seeing God in everyone. This is the great doctrine that our, our entire monastic order is based on, actually. But, but notice that this doctrine, that we should serve human beings by seeing, by, by, by seeing God in each one of us, is based not on Shankara's Advaita Vedanta, but, but on Vigyana Vedanta. It's only if every soul is a real manifestation of God that we can, that we can worship God by serving them. This is the philosophical logic. Now, let's look at what Swami Vivekananda says. How does he explain practical Vedanta? He says the following. 
But what is more practical than worshiping here, worshiping you? I see you, feel you, and I know you are God. The Mohammedan says there is no God but Allah. The Vedanta says there is nothing that is not God. The living God is within you, and yet you are building churches and temples and believing all sorts of imaginary nonsense. The only God to worship is the human soul in the human body. Of course, all animals are temples too, but man is the highest, the Taj Mahal of temples. If I cannot worship in that, no other temple will be of any advantage. And so what I try to show in my book chapter is that this doctrine of practical Vedanta is grounded in Swamiji's metaphysics of integral Advaita. Unless you accept that everything in this world and that all living beings are real manifestations of God, you can't provide a grounding, a proper metaphysical grounding for this kind of ethics of seva, of, of, of serving other human beings. Now, briefly, I, I just want to mention Shankara. Well, maybe Shankara also can accommodate this kind of seva. He can in a certain sense because he talks about karma yoga. Karma yoga is the yoga of selfless action. So one kind of karma yoga can be serving others. That's certainly true. But what is the status of karma yoga in relation to other yogas in Shankara's philosophy? He says that it's for, karma yoga is for inferior spiritual aspirants who have insufficiently pure minds. And so through the practice of karma yoga, we purify our minds. And the moment we get a sufficiently pure mind, we stop karma yoga. This is just well, Shankara 101. And then we go on to the higher practice of jnana yoga, the yoga of knowledge, and only then can we attain knowledge of Brahman. Now, Swami Vivekananda criticizes Shankara's lack of emphasis on social service in a number of places, and I want to mention a few of them. In a letter to the Pandit Pramadadas Mitra, on 20th May, 1897, Swamiji says the following, the Upanishads and the Gita are the true scriptures. Rama, Krishna, Buddha, Chaitanya, Nanak, Kabir, and so on are the true avatars. For their hearts were as infinite as the sky, and above all, Ramakrishna. Ramanuja, Shankara, etc. seem to have been mere pundits with much narrowness of heart. Shankidno Ridoy, it's an original Bengali letter. Narrowness of heart. Where is that love, that weeping heart at the sorrow of others? Dry pedantry of the pundit and the feeling of only oneself getting to salvation, hurry scurry. In another letter to his disciple Alasinga Pirumal, dated 20th August, 1893, he says the following. It's a striking passage and one which I think many are not familiar with. He says, no religion on earth preaches the dignity of humanity in such a lofty strain as Hinduism. And no religion on earth treads upon the necks of the poor and the low in such a fashion as Hinduism. The Lord has shown me that religion is not in fault, but it is the Pharisees and Sadducees in Hinduism, hypocrites who invent all sorts of engines of tyranny in the shape of doctrines of Paramatika and Vyavaharika. This is the only place in the entire nine volume complete works where he refers to the original Sanskrit terms Paramatika and Vyavaharika. And it's a scathing rebuke, scathing condemnation. Why? It seems to me that the reason is that the moment Advaita, classical Advaita Vedanta relegates this entire world to the realm of merely empirical reality, Vyavaharika Satta. It thereby justifies apathy toward the world. It's not ultimately real. Why bother about it? And Swamiji thinks that's the original sin of Advaita Vedanta. And he had to change that doctrine. He was an Advaita Vedantin, but he, he rejected that aspect of it. He said, the relative world is not unreal, it's not non-existent, it's fully real, and it's, in fact, it's God. So we must worship God by serving human beings. Fifth doctrine, four yogas. Swami Vivekananda says that all four yogas are direct and independent paths to liberation. Again, I think he gets this doctrine from, from Sri Ramakrishna. This is what Sri Ramakrishna says in one place. The Vigyani sees that the reality which is nirguna is also saguna. The jnani's path leads to truth as does the path that combines jnana and bhakti. The bhakta's path too leads to truth. Jnana yoga is true and bhakti yoga is true. Then he says, God can be realized through all paths. And now we should ask ourselves, how, how is it that Sri Ramakrishna arrived at this very broad doctrine, Jatamot as many, as many doctrines, so many paths? The key is 
the metaphysical basis is this Vigyana Vedanta, that Jini Nirgun Tini Shogun, the Vigyani sees that the reality, he says it here, the Vigyani sees that the reality which is Nirguna is also Saguna. That means that the personal God is as real as the impersonal absolute. And because of that, bhaktas are not going astray or they're not doing something inferior to Jnana Yogis. They're worshiping a real aspect of the same God. This is the logic, right? Now, in the same way, Swami Vekananda derives this teaching about the four yogas from his very broad conception of God as both impersonal and personal. He says the following in Karma Yoga, each one of our yogas is fitted to make man perfect even without the help of the others because they have all the same goal in view. The yogas of work, Karma Yoga, of wisdom, Jnana Yoga, and of devotion, Bhakti Yoga, are all capable of serving as direct and independent means for the attainment of moksha. And you might think, well, where's Raja Yoga? Why does that get left out? He adds that in another passage. For instance, his epigraph to Raja Yoga, the famous Mahamantras. He says, each soul is potentially divine. The goal is to manifest this divinity within by controlling nature external and internal. Do this either by work, Karma Yoga, or worship, Bhakti Yoga, or psychic control, Raja Yoga, or philosophy, Jnana Yoga. By one, or more, or all of these, and be free. This is the, so, it's the same doctrine, except now he's adding the fourth yoga. So all four yogas are direct and independent paths to liberation, according to Swami Vivekananda. At the same time, he says, even though you can attain the highest through any one particular yoga, it's better to try to combine all four yogas to the best of our ability. He thinks that it's, it's the best way to make for a kind of balanced and well-rounded personality and the best way to accelerate our own spiritual progress. By, by taking advantage of and utilizing all the different resources in our personality. Now, in this regard, in the context of Swami Vivekananda's Doctrine of the Four Yogas, there's a scholar named Anantaran Rambachan. He's a senior scholar now. I just recently met him at a conference in Notre Dame a couple, just last week. He wrote a book in 1994 called The Limits of Scripture. The whole book is a sustained criticism of some of the main doctrines of Swami Vivekananda. He's writing as a Shankarite, actually. He was a f follower of Shankara, but a particular tradition of Shankara, Dayananda Saraswati, the, the late Dayananda Saraswati. And what Rambachan says in chapter three of this book is that Shankara's understanding that only one yoga, namely Jnana Yoga, leads directly to moksha is a more logical doctrine than Swamiji's doctrine, that all four yogas lead to moksha. The reason being that Swami Vivekananda fails to explain the precise mechanism by which the other three yogas, bhakti yoga, karma yoga, and raja yoga, lead to the highest goal of liberation. He says there's a kind of uh, systemic ambiguity and a, and a lack of clarity. There's a kind of haziness. He says, for instance, that Vivekananda unjustifiably assumes that through the practice of any of the four yogas, quote, avidya, meaning ignorance, by some means or other, spontaneously falls away in the automatic manifestation of Brahma jnana, end quote. This is Ram Bachchan's main criticism of Swamiji's doctrine of the four yogas. Now, one thing I'll say before I try to defend Swamiji against Ram Bachchan, I find it uh, unfortunate that one of the tendencies among Hindus and followers of Ram Krishna and Vivekananda, when they encounter a book like this, they dismiss it without reading it. They, they start calling the author names. Even worse, sometimes they send death threats. You should not do that, please. <laughs> To be intellectually honest and rigorous, what you should do is read the book, assess the arguments, treat it like a Purvapaksha position. If you're a follower of Swamiji, you love Swamiji, use it as an exercise in faith-seeking understanding. It's a way of strengthening your own faith. Ram Bachchan is no fool. He's actually a very, very intelligent scholar and he makes very thoughtful arguments. The best thing you can do is read the book and let's see if you can defend Swamiji against his arguments. It's not that easy, actually. All right, now back after this little sermon. All right, so now, the point is, Ram Bachchan says, Shankara beautifully explains how the path of jnana, jnana yoga, leads to moksha because it's based on scriptures, the shruti, the Upanishads. And when a qualified preceptor, guru, tells you tattvamasi, one of the mahavakyas, or aham brahmasmi, and the disciple has a sufficiently pure mind and is ready, spiritually speaking, to get that highest insight, all ignorance is destroyed, and the knowledge of Brahman is generated. So it's Shruti Janita Jnana. This Jnana, this knowledge of Brahman, is generated by the hearing of Shruti, of scripture. This is the mechanism. Rambhaja says this is perfectly clear and beautiful. It's elegant. And Swamiji does not explain how any of the other three yogas 
actually lead to the highest goal of moksha. Now, the key here is, I think that Rambachan is misunderstanding something in Swamiji's work. According to Swamiji, we already have the innate knowledge of Brahman within us. We're all, in a sense, already jnanis. But we fail to manifest this knowledge because of our mental impurities. So through any of the four yogas, any yogas at all, we purify our minds, thereby removing the veils of impurity, covering our innate knowledge of Brahman. He says, for instance, in one place, the knowledge which is ours will be manifest through the practice of any of the four yogas. The knowledge which is ours, it's already within us, will be manifest through the practice of any of the four yogas, not just jnana yoga. In another place, it's a, it's a text called the Four Paths of Yoga. He says, the whole scope of all systems of yoga is to clear up this ignorance of Brahman by purifying the mind. So his idea is, all four yogas are direct and independent paths to moksha since they are all equally effective means of purifying the mind, thereby removing what he calls the veils, the veils of impurity covering our ever-present and innate knowledge of our true nature as the divine Atman. This is the way I see um, the line of defense of Swamiji against Rambachan's criticisms. Again, I think that there's a deep resonance with Sri Ramakrishna's teachings. Sri Ramakrishna used to teach, Shuddha mon, Shuddha buddhi, Ashuddha Atma, Aki Jinish. Pure mind, pure intelligence, and pure Atman are one and the same. This is, so many people find this teaching baffling. What does he mean by that? How can a pure mind be the same thing as a pure Atman? I think in exactly the sense that Swamiji means it. Because if you attain purity of mind, that knowledge of Brahman which is already in us will become manifest. Finally, sixth doctrine. His doctrine of the harmony of religions. I discuss this in great detail in chapter three of my book. I'm going to give a very, very brisk summary. As I mentioned, I think that there's not one doctrine, but three doctrines of the harmony of religions at different phases in his career, beginning in 1893 when he gave these lectures in, in the World's Parliament of Religions. I'm not going to discuss phase one because it's not directly relevant to what I'm discussing today. I want to discuss the second and third phases of his thinking about the harmony of religions. September 1894 to May 1895, for a period of about nine months. He taught the harmony of all religions on the basis of the three stages of Vedanta, Dvaita, Vishta Dvaita, and Advaita. This is the last place I have found where he defends this view. This is a letter to his disciple, Alasinga Pirumal, on 6th May, 1895. He says the following, Now I will tell you my discovery. All of religion is contained in the Vedanta, that is, in the three stages of the Vedanta philosophy, the Dvaita, Vishta Dvaita, and Advaita. One comes after the other. These are the three stages of spiritual growth in man. Each one is necessary. This is the essential of religion. The Vedanta applied to the various ethnic customs and creeds of India is Hinduism. The first stage, i.e. Dvaita, applied to the ideas of the ethnic groups of Europe is Christianity, as applied to the Semitic groups, Mohammedanism. The Advaita, as applied in its yoga perception form, is Buddhism, etc. Now by religion is meant the Vedanta. The applications must vary according to the different needs, surroundings, and other circumstances of different nations. What this position amounts to is what scholars of religion, philosophers of religion, and theologians call religious inclusivism. This is an Advaitic religious inclusivism because what Swamiji is claiming is that Advaita is the highest. Other paths are not wrong, but they're lower stages on the way to Advaita. And so he relegates all theistic religious traditions, Christianity, Islam, presumably all the theistic traditions within Hinduism, to the realm of Dvaita, or at best, Vishta Dvaita. But each stage is necessary, he says that too, which means that that's not enough. You have to ultimately go on to the highest Advaitic realization. So he's clearly putting Advaita on a higher footing than theistic religions in this brief period of nine months, from 1894 to mid-1895. Now, shortly thereafter, he abandons this view. And the first question is why? I think because he possibly, this is completely speculative, but one possible reason is that he reflected more on the teachings of his beloved guru, Sri Ramakrishna. And Sri Ramakrishna, it's, you'll be very hard pressed to find anywhere in the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, any talk of higher and lower, that Advaita is, is a higher state, a higher philosophy than, than Vishta Advaita or Advaita. And Swamiji may have thought, wait a minute, I need to teach the harmony of religions in as liberal a spirit as Sri Ramakrishna did. 
that's speculative, but in any case, now let's go. What is this, what is this third phase? The third phase begins in late 1895 and goes all the way up to the end of his life. You'll find any, any lecture, any place where he explains the harmony of religions starting in late 1895, he does so not on the basis of the three stages of Vedanta. He never, agree, he never again teaches the harmony of religions on the basis of the three stages of Vedanta. Instead, he explains the harmony of religions on the basis of the framework of the four yogas. The previous doctrine I just explained. Each of the four yogas is a direct and independent path to moksha. How does this argument work? It proceeds in three stages. One, each of the four yogas is equally capable of leading us to salvation. That's the previous doctrine I just mentioned. He says, each one of our yogas is fitted to make man perfect, even without the help of the others, right? Then, how does he arrive at the harmony of religions? Argument two, claim two. Every world religion corresponds to one of these four yogas. He says this, for instance, in his lecture on Sri Ramakrishna. He says, this is a quote, a man may be intellectual or devotional or mystic or active. The various religions represent one or the other of these types. Intellectual means jnana yoga, devotional bhakti yoga, mystic raja yoga, active karma yoga. Each world religion corresponds to one of these four yogas. And three, religious pluralism flows directly from these two premises. Since each yoga is equally effective in taking us to salvation, and each of the major world religions corresponds to one of the yogas, all of these world religions have equal effectiveness in leading to salvation. He says this explicitly in the same lecture on Sri Ramakrishna, delivered in 1896. He says that every religion, quote, has the same saving power as the other. This is a significant shift from that previous nine-month position, where Advaita is higher. It has greater saving power because it's the only direct path to liberation. So this is what scholars of religion called religious pluralism as opposed to religious inclusivism. So whereas in that brief nine-month period, ending in May 1895, Swami Vekananda advocated an Advaitic inclusivism, which put Advaita at the highest stage and, and relegated theistic religions to a, a lower stage. Starting in late 1895, all the way to the end of his life, he taught the harmony of religions as a full-blown religious pluralism, which means that he granted equal effectiveness to all the different world religions, whether they're theistic or non-theistic. So it's a much broader, more liberal teaching, and it's more in line with Sri Ramakrishna's own teachings. Uh, so I've said a lot, and it's uh, sort of dense, and, but I do encourage you, please, that uh, if you want to delve more deeply into what I've been talking about today, read chapters two and three of my book. I know reading is passe now in this world of Twitter and whatever, Facebook, but please. Okay, I'm open to questions now. Om Shanti 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 Harihi Om Tatsat Sri Ramakrishna Parnamastu